Hey, in the last episode we've covered some really fun games. This one's no worse, so let's jump straight in and check them out. Airline Tycoon is a business simulation in which you manage your own airlines. It came from the 1990s king of the management and simulation games, so German developers, and it's a rather large and interesting title, despite the color for humorous graphics. You are pitted against three other opponents and have to complete various different financial objectives split over numerous unique missions. And since there's 48 different airports and practically unlimited number of planes out of 18 models that can be flying at any moment in the game, you're gonna have your hands full and a lot to do. Naturally, you're responsible for everything required in running of the airport. So, you'll hire and fire staff, take commissions, buy, repair and retrofit your airplanes, equip them to suit your customers' needs. And that's not even all, we're just scratching the surface. You'll attend various meetings, plan flight routes, buy fuel and... Well, there's no way going around it, you can also sabotage your opponents and work as hard on disrupting their activities as you will on expanding yours. Interestingly enough, all four of your opponents can be humans too and you don't have to play against the CPU only. That said, multiplayer does not support hot seat and only network play. So couch versus at one PC playing together and arguing as you would in most other games in the early 90s is sadly not the case here. Airline Tycoon's graphics are very nice and humorously designed and the sounds are rather good too, though nothing special in particular but that's to be expected from a purely management game. It's not the presentation that makes or breaks the games however, but gameplay. And fortunately, there's heaps of it in Airline Tycoon and if you like business management titles, you're not gonna be bored here. Working on offering better services at higher profit margins, eliminating the competition in the process. It's worth pointing out though that Airline Tycoon is not the most demanding game out there and if you expect a considerable challenge, other titles may be a better pick. Prisoner of Ice is a tough cookie to crack. On one hand, it's inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and stylized to be similar to his works, with beautiful high-resolution graphics, which in some screens seems more like paintings than digital art. And on another, it's crippled by high degree of linearity and invisible walls of wrongful progress. Wow, what a name. I'm coining it today, write that down. What I mean by that is that you can't use objects in wrong places, and all the actions that do not push the plot forward end up with a generic you can't do that response. Taking you out of experience sounding generic like a wall that you cannot pass. Not to mention certain few pixels in size objects that not only have to be found at their precise locations, but are also clicked on. And in high res display with a mouse, yet alone the mouse you could get in the 90s, it was easier said than done. And the last drop in this already overfilling bucket are illogical puzzles that often require use of seemingly unfitting objects which in turn makes you scout each and every area top to bottom trying to find everything as you never know what and where will be needed. So why is Prisoner of Ice even here if there is so much wrong with it? It's elementary, which coincidentally is a phrase that Sherlock never spoke in any of the books and is a creation coming straight from TV and movies only. I seem to be getting off topic here, so let's jump back on it. Prisoner of Ice is here because despite all the issues, its plot is not only one of the best in the horror adventure genre, but it's also excellently paced and you will find yourself immersed in it quite easily if you're into dark horror and can overlook few minor annoyances. Upon its release, Colin McRae Riley became a hit and an instant one at that. It released on Windows and on the PlayStation at the same time and sold better on the latter than virtually any other racer at the time did. But why was it such a huge success coming seemingly out of nowhere? Well, it was the best rally game of its time and an excellently balanced title mixing simulation and arcade racing aspects perfectly, with neither of them taking the forefront and both adding to the experience. It features 8 real life cars like the famous Colin McRae's Subaru Impreza, all drivers from the 1998 World Rally Championship season and a selection of 52 stages split over 8 different countries. All that available in free game modes. Championship, which sees you racing on all stages in the full season mode against real-life drivers of the time. Rally, allowing you to take part in a single rally in any of the countries that you've unlocked in Championship. And finally, Time Trial is, well, exactly what its name suggests and you're trying to beat the previous best time on any course in the game, either alone or head-to-head -head in split-screen with someone else. Each of the cars feels different when driving, so everyone should be able to find one that they'll be comfortable behind the steering wheel and capable for going for the championship in. Colin McRae Rally came out in time when previous Rally Championship and V-Rally games were considered a benchmark in WRC racing. It came and pushed them off the podium, easily taking the top spot. Especially that, with excellent graphics, the sensation of speed and daredevil driving also came the presentation. 
The graphics were incredible for the time, especially the cars which were high polygon and high detail, but the tracks and roadside objects were quite good too, making the game feel very enchanting and realistic. Oh, and the pilot that sat next to you and shouted all the turns, jumps and bumps out was just fantastic. In behind the wheel view with good headphones on in 1998, Colin McRae Rally was the best way you could feel as if you were really driving on one of those mud covered forest tracks. And no other title could offer such immersion in the same quality level. Tex Murphy Overseer is the fifth title in the futuristic Dark Noir series of private detective team point and click adventure games. Same as two previous outings, Overseer combines FMV sequences with 3D environments and also takes place in post World War III San Francisco divided between the so called norms and mutants. And while it's set in 2043, most of the plot is told by retrospectives in conversations between Tex and his then beloved Chelsea Bando, in which he recalls the events of his first case from 2037. Interestingly enough, said case is basically a retelling of Mean Streets, so the first game's story, but with some slight changes. For one, it's more detailed and realistic, secondly, the locations of most important events have been changed too, and finally, plot diverts from original a bit here and there, which means that theoretically, one of both of these games, first or last, is through Overseal losing its in-lore status. The story goes as follows. In 2037, Tex was hired by Sylvia Linsky, the very one who would later on become his future wife and now ex-wife, to investigate the case of her father's supposed suicide. At least Cubs deemed it so, closing the investigation while she believed that it was a murder. Turns out, she was right, and Tex becomes intertwined in a plot involving implants and mind control, eventually finding himself in a position of being the only one who could stop it. The game still uses the so-called virtual world engine, meaning that outside of conversations you're basically free to explore every nook and cranny of available locations, searching for hints and clues, turning around and being able to look everywhere. The aforementioned conversations are a treat too, and very often as funny as they can be dark and in the very same climate they were in previous series entries. Overseer is a considerable step up in terms of presentation as compared to previous titles too. The gameplay window is window no more and can take the whole screen. The graphics are bumped from 256 colors to true color, so 16 million, and henceforth Overseer feels much more atmospheric, close to life and immersive. With these changes naturally came change in the requirements, and running Overseer at the time on anything weaker than Pentium 2 with 3D acceleration meant having to cut down on the quality. Tex Murphy Overseer could be played in one of two modes. Entertainer, that allowed for bypassing of some of the puzzles and featured hints, and Gamer, in which all puzzles were mandatory and no hints were provided. I'd hate to break it to you, but playing it on anything else than the Gamer was a mistake, as it's an experience like no other in 1998, and it's not worth to water it down, allowing some of the puzzles to be missed. Fighting Force is the first 3D brawler slash beat'em up that I ever played, and that's why it holds a special place in my heart. I know it's not the best, I know it's not the most innovative, and I know it's not even the best looking, but, like I said, to me, it was special. And it's a Streets of Rage or Final Fight type of a game, but in 3D. So you pick one of four unique characters going through the urban environments of a large city and later on super secret evil villains headquarters island, battling never-ending waves of enemies. I'm exaggerating of course, as if they didn't end we wouldn't have levels in the game and we most definitely do. Also, the location is not as secret as we know exactly where it is, but we do now, years later. In 1998, it was still a mystery. Anyway, same as in most other beat'em ups, use of found objects like knives, guns or guns is not only possible, but advisable, and the game allowed for picking up of routes you'll go through from time to time, which considerably extended Fighting Force's replayability. Because seeing all that it has to offer required at least few playthroughs. Dr. Dex Zeng, criminal mastermind with a literal hired army at his disposal predicted that the world would end in the year 2000. As the New Year's Eve of 1999 came, he realized that there was an unmistakable error in his predictions and instead of doing what grown-ups do, so learning from the experience and putting it all behind, outgrowing the failure, he went the kindergarten way and decided to ensure the world's destruction himself. One has to wonder why would any of his goons follow him knowing that he wants to destroy the world? But since the cults are not a new thing, we can safely assume that that's the reasoning behind their behavior. All four characters that you can play as are different and unique in their sets of regular and special attacks, and one of them can even lift and throw a car engines. Which you know, was hella cool back then when I played it first. Fighting Force can naturally be enjoyed with a friend on the same PC, and that's the best way to experience it and one I would recommend if you have a choice.
When I saw the Godfather for the first time sitting through its ungodly long run, I felt as if the world around me changed. I wanted to be a mobster, a crime family lieutenant and even eventually a boss. But first I decided to read the book and since I grew up in a house full of them I didn't have to look for long. It was so much better than this already brilliant movie. I mean I think I devoured the book in like two three sitting stops, so naturally after seeing The Godfather then reading it and realizing that I could never really leave it so to speak, I wanted to at the very least play it. And while there were games that kinda quote unquote touched the subject like Pizza Tycoon for instance, there was nothing that would focus completely on the subject. Enter Gangsters Organized Crime. It was a unique title taking place in a fictional Chicago suburb of New Temperance during Prohibition and at the considerable scope, with Borough featuring over 5,000 unique citizens, 400 of these being gangsters. And overall speaking, your goal naturally is to secure as much money as possible through bribery, theft and aggression, oh. among others. In practice there are specific winning conditions, but we'll get to that in a bit. Gameplay is a combination of turns and real time. So, first you issue all the orders to your lieutenants and then they act on them in real time. But to become the most respected and richest crime lord out there, you have to make sure to keep all the other gangs at bay and expand your territory to secure sources of income, which means having local businesses pay you protection money. You also need to expand on your gang's size and arm all your hoods to the teeth, mm. keeping in mind their unique abilities as these all make them useful for different kinds of missions and activities. So you have to be both, jack of all trades and master of all. Yeah, I know what I said. All that to telegraph the strength of your gang and to be ready to be able to handle everything that the opposing families and the game will throw at you. Nothing's free though, and since the protection money is hardly enough to cover some of the basic expenses, you'll also need to purchase businesses, both legal and otherwise. Raid opposing families' businesses bribe people left and right to ensure the standing and security of your gang in the city. There are three ways to win the game of gangsters. First, so-called get straight, which requires you to earn a particular large sum of money, catch being that it has to come from legal businesses only. And on top of that, you need to make sure that none of your hoods are wanted by the police and eventually retire from crime, which seems easy, but just because you may want to go clean doesn't mean that the other gangs that oppose you will treat you any different. The second is getting elected as mayor. This one requires a good lawyer, Jimmy McGill kind of a lawyer, a lot of money, huge territory under your control and if that wasn't enough, secure loads of votes. So happiness of citizens will be your priority and not the money from protection. So you'll need to protect your regions, raid the opponents and don't get in the way of your voters day to day lives too much. Finally, domination and it's the most difficult winning condition out of them all. It requires a complete destruction of all the other gangs. The difficulty doesn't come from their opposition however, but from the heat that all your attacks on them will generate. And directly following it, police and FBI interest in you and your gang's activities. XCOM Interceptor is the fourth main game in the XCOM franchise series, an editor from the classic turn-based strategy with RPG formula. This time, XCOM is a mixture of space combat and business simulation with strategy elements. So, you manage numerous XCOM space station, pilot starships during combat encounters, beat interception, base defense or base attack. And yes, sadly, generally speaking, that's all you'll be doing behind the steering stick, alone and by coordinating your wingman. Other than that, you'll also manage your base's resources and double in research. And the research tree is very disappointing, lacking in both scope and breadth feeling devoid of anything noteworthy when compared to earlier games. Interceptor is very combat focused and that's also its biggest problem. Because unfortunately, it's not very fun. Sure, it's not the worst you've seen, but compared to other space-based shooters out there like Wing Commander, it falls short in terms of both variety and fun. Story-wise, because all XCOM games have to have one, the game begins on March 1st, 2067. Earth's resources are nearly depleted and whatever's left is so difficult to extract that it's not worth the money or effort anymore. So, to avert the seemingly inevitable fall of humanity, major corporations turned to space and more specifically area of it known only as the frontier. It's raw materials rich, so a great place for us to find what we need to survive that little bit longer. What we didn't realize at first glance though, is that the area is not empty at all and is already in the scope of interest of aliens we've met during the first alien war depicted in the first game. You're a part of an elite force chosen for their tenacity, skill and perseverance, and tasked with hunting down and defeating aliens in space. XCOM Interceptor, while an interesting sidestep from the mainline games, was not very good at what it was best at which sounds odd but best explains its faults and was most definitely not what fans of the series wanted. 
While Julian Golub of XCOM fame may have not had a lot of do with Interceptor we just spoke about, he was a mastermind behind Magic and Mayhem. The game, not in real life. And it's a real-time strategy with role-playing elements. Also, one of the few games in the genre that I can actually enjoy to some degree, which is not something you'll hear me saying about RTSs often. Probably because it's not a typical representative of the genre in any shape or form. You play as Cornelius, a mage, on a quest to find his missing uncle Luca, a great mage who mysteriously disappeared while fighting against the evil overlord. A villain who's for once in gaming appropriately menacingly named. To find your uncle, you'll need to traverse through 12 levels, finding and defeating evil archmages in each. You'll do so by using a variety of spells, mainly summons, although while doing so smartly, not to use up all of your mana too fast, as it can only be charged up in the so-called places of power that require capturing first. And it's that titular magic that the game revolves around, as you have no real armies. All units that you command are summoned and all the buffs and protection spells come from you. Before each stage you pick which spells to take with you, so that you're sorta of responsible for deciding what will your magical arsenal for that mission consist of. That said, you can find various items in the game, anything from summoning stones through artifacts enhancing your abilities to talismans granting new spells. Each of the 12 levels, or realms if you will, has its own team and is randomly generated. Yep, you heard that right. Each next playthrough of Magic and Mayhem can feel and play out different as the maps are never the same. But neither story-based characters nor buildings will, so the plot always stays the same and it's the map layout that is amended only. Each completed level rewards you with experience which you can use to increase your attributes. You know, to become bigger, bulkier and stronger. Oh wait, wrong game. I know, to become wiser, more powerful and deadly in the arcana. That's more like it. Presentation-wise, Magic and Mayhem, while only being top-down isometric, looks fantastic. It's colorful, but the attention to detail spills from the screen in everything that the game entails. From backgrounds to little touches like buildings being distractible, especially under certain spells, fire spreading and eating everything in its way, or even as small and charming touches as idle and combat animations. Notable example of being your zombies tearing their own arms to use them as clubs against the enemies. It's just great. Sounds and music are excellent too and well fit to the theme of the adventure. Magic and Mayhem is a very special game. It's not too difficult, not too easy, it seems to be in this perfect middle spot, providing plenty enough challenge to anyone without being punishing or annoying. This one's gonna be a bit difficult for me to talk about as it's the one that killed my love for the entire franchise. But don't let it sway you into not appreciating it as it's hell of a game, just changed to the point as compared to the previous ones that I did not enjoy it as much as I should. Anyway, Settlers 3 is a real-time city building slash combat game. It features three unique nations of romance, Egyptians and Japanese, and they fight it against each other in the name of deities that they believe in, who are all coincidentally addressed by their subjects as he. So, I suppose, in the team of the game that would be you. Anyway, for the most part Settlers 3 is very similar to the previous ones, meaning that a lot of focus initially is put on a city building and creation of advanced nations serving supply and demand chains. This time with different economic models for each of the nations, making them feel unique and multiple playthroughs more viable. They also have their own buildings, cleric spells and abilities, ensuring high replayability. Supposedly, as I always felt that Settlers 3 lost a lot of charm as compared to Settlers to Gold. I was in the minority though, as it sold very well and became universally liked and appreciated game. One change that I had very mixed feelings about, not necessarily good or bad, but something between the two, were the roads. In previous games, there were the veins that kept the entire body of the nation running, moving resources and units between the locations, and being the base of everything that happened in the city slash kingdom. So, a correct, smart and well thought out road layout could make a huge difference in nearly all that the game had to offer. In Settlers 3, you don't build roads at all. They are created naturally, organically on pathways that are most walked by your citizens. On one hand, it makes a lot of sense, as it's fitting to the whole primitival town team, but on another, in real life, roads were built even in ancient Rome, and large cities and kingdoms definitely had them made rather than appear in the place of a beaten path. Like I said, it's a very polarizing subject to me, and I don't know how to feel about it. Also, Settlers 3 finally allowed for a direct control of all military units. Perhaps I don't subscribe to the Combat RTS Genre Lovers Club, what a name, I wish something like that really existed, but that change made the combat much more efficient and dependent on the gamer's skills, for better or worse. Settlers 3 is not a bad game, not in the slightest. It's just one that alienated me from its series and I'm not sure why really. I should really give it a chance again, shouldn't I? Or do I get and try the new one out? What do you think?
Billionaire is an excellent take on the Monopoly formula that can be played in single or two-player mode, and it's easily one of my most favorite games following the board game idea. Well, based on it really as it does a lot of things differently. Same as in Monopoly, you can buy properties and erect buildings on them too. These are houses, hotels, offices and skyscrapers among others, so even in that aspect alone, there's much more variety here. You also have a bit more influence on the amount charged when someone enters your property, which is always fun. You can buy businesses and build your own companies in Billionaire too, and rename slash name them for that extra little touch of fun. So, it's not unusual when playing against someone to have your Microsoft perform better than your opponent's Apple or vice versa. What's more, they are actually a function in stock market companies, meaning they stocks perform better or worse and can be purchased by other players if available on the market. So, a game can even sometimes come down to one player having considerably more properties and companies, but the other one winning despite that. Because of securing more capital initially and buying controlling portions of shares in the first one's companies when they were still cheap and effectively being the first to get to the billion in net worth. Oh, because of course I failed to mention it, that you are racing to get to the billion. Silly me. Billionary, being as expanded on the original idea as it was, was still prone to the same issues. Namely, if the players were not more or less on the same level, at some point it was possible to predict with near 100% accuracy which one of them would win. And since it's a computer game and neither of the players can be a bank, there's no chance for a quote-unquote sudden secret injection of cash to anyone's pocket to carry on gaming and only limited official bank loans. But all I just told you about Billionaire is just scratching the surface, there is much more content in the game. It is, after all, an ultimate Monopoly experience that you can have on PC. So, if you're interested, definitely check it out. Cool games, right? What do you think of them? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.